Thank you, praise team, for that um, worship time to focus on God and what He has done for us and who He is, how majestic God is. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit more um, today. Um, in your Bibles, go ahead and turn to the book of Ecclesiastes. We're coming to the end of this study through the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. I'm going to look at the first eight verses to begin with today. Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Been an interesting journey through this book of um, a very different type of literature that something we're not really used to in the literature that we read and are used to today. Um, trying to see a little bit of what Solomon says, this book of wisdom kind of wrapped up in a, um, a different type of writing. So Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth. Before the evil days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble and the mighty men stoop, the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and those who look through the windows grow dim, and the doors on the streets are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low, and one will arise at the sound of the birds, and all the daughters of the song will sing softly." Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. The almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper drags himself along, and desire is no longer stirred. For man goes to his eternal home while mourners go about in the street. Remember him before the silver cord is broken, and the golden bowl is crushed, and the pitcher by the well is shattered, and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. One of the things we've decided as we go through the book of Ecclesiastes is that if we're not careful, this book will depress you, right? There's a lot of depressing thoughts because Solomon keeps talking about death. And, uh, and the reason he keeps talking about death is to show us that uh, during this life, we have a period of time to live and we need to live this life correctly before this life ends. And that's the reason he keeps bringing up death so much. I almost entitled this message, The Big Bow, because Solomon finally wraps up everything here in chapter 12. And I believe in a way um, that helps us have the uh, proper understanding of what he's been trying to say uh, throughout, throughout these ch um, chapters. Uh, but as we look at Ecclesiastes, as we've gone through this, probably a book that you've not studied that much, maybe not read very often, but as we have gone through this, hopefully you've been able to um, learn some of the wisdom that Solomon um, reveals to us uh, through this book and, that, and we'll be able to have that correct outlook on life because that's what the whole book's about, having the correct view of life, the correct outlook on life, not just a life under the sun, which is vanity, and that's the life that, where God's not involved, but the life that's lived um, for God. And that's what he talks about throughout the book, and he wraps it all up here at the very end. Um, in this chapter, chapter 12, Solomon basically has two ideas that he wants to um, give to us that I want to share with you today, again, to help us have the right outlook on life. So let's go ahead and take a look at what Solomon says about um, Life. He says, first of, excuse me, he says, first of all, remember your creator. That's what we need to do. We need to remember our creator. In fact, this is probably one of those verses, and we've, we've looked at them along the way, that you've probably heard from Ecclesiastes, maybe didn't know exactly where it was found. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. Solomon is saying to us, we need to remember God every day of our life because one day we will get old and one day we will die. And so each one of these days is important, counted as an important day, and remember God every day. And then he does something very interesting in verses 3 through 5. He describes us getting older in these verses. And let me just go back over them again and, and, and tell you what he's saying in, in case you didn't catch it. Um, so in verses 3 through 5, in the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, as we get older, all of a sudden there, we start shaking a little bit, right? He says, the mighty men stoop. We've been standing up straight, getting older, we start to stoop over a little bit with the bad back. The grinding ones stand idle because they are few. We start losing our teeth. 
Those who look through the windows grow dim. Our eyesight gets worse. The doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. Our hearing loss as we get older. Furthermore, men are afraid of a high place and of terrors on the road. We're not as stable. We're not as agile as we were when we were younger. The almond tree blossoms, white hair. The grasshopper drags himself along, knee pain, hip pain. We recognize that, right? So I, I have to admit something. When I was in college, we were, um, we were, we were in a class, and I remember studying this um, chapter 12. And as we were studying it, and the professor was describing, hey, this Solomon is telling us what it's like to get old. He's describing getting older, and he's describing dying a, a little bit later. And as, I, as we went through this, I you know, kind of chuckled along. And um, I have to admit, it, it was kind of amusing to me to hear this description, you know, as a 20-year-old, to hear this description of getting older. So it was amusing to me. Now it's starting to describe me. Not so amusing anymore. So then, as he describes getting older, in verses 6 and 7, he reminds us that one day we will die. Remember him. Remember, you're supposed to remember him in the days of youth. Remember him before the silver cord is broken, the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered, and the wheel at the cistern is crushed. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. These are descriptions um, of, of death and, and kind of metaphors, these pictures of, of, of a way to, that they would talk about death in those days, kind of like we might say, um, you're going to kick the bucket. And so we'd say, you're going to kick the bucket. He says, the silver cord is broken, the golden bowl is crushed, things like that. But those are all descriptions of death. So he's talked about life. Remember God in the days of your youth. He talks about getting older, and then he talks about death. Now, it's interesting, Solomon does talk about eternity because there's not a lot mentioned in the Old Testament about eternity. We, we see the blessings of God during our life, but, but we are created to live forever, and Solomon shows us that. He says, the dust will return to the earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, as we talk about, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. And so he talks about our spirit living on forever. And so we're not created to just live this life. But during this life, we, we see, we understand, we are making our preparations for um, our eternal life. Living that now and the experiencing that uh, relationship with God now. But God has created us to have that relationship with him for eternity. So these are words of wisdom spoken by Solomon telling us how to live and we do it by remembering. Now, as we think about old age and getting older and eventually dying, somebody, it reminded me that somebody just this week told me about the recent Time magazine um, cover and it focuses on the length of life. And, you know, with, with medicine and medical science and new, and new things that we're learning, there's that question, you know, the, and I've heard it before, that question. So how, you know, how much longer are we going to live? And that's what these, these articles are about in Time magazine. And what I did was I went to some 80-year-olds and I said, so how would you like to live to be 142? They weren't too excited about that prospect. Not if they were going to feel like they were feel, starting to feel at 80. But we do everything, it seems like, to want to live longer. We don't want to think about our own death. We, want to, you know, we don't like to think of somebody else dying, and we don't want to die. It seems like that we just keep, you know, you, you find with people that fight. You know, even the things that people will do to, to stay alive, uh, because even if we might say, oh, I'm, I'm not very happy right now, or, or um, this life is tough. Boy, you get to, the, to that point for a lot of people, and you say, okay, then your life's over right now, and they're ready to back up and say, well, no, no, I'll, I'll take a couple more days, you know, I'll take a little bit longer. We have this desire to live, and I know we've been created to live. We didn't, God didn't create us for this body to die one day, and so I think that's why it's so unnatural for us as we think about this, that, that you know, we don't want to think about death. And, you know, obviously there's some thoughts about it and some unknown about all that, but we know in Christ, you know, we don't have to fear that. Uh, we don't have to fear what's going to happen um, after this body dies because we have the promises of Scripture. So it's, it's not just about 
living longer, but it's living better. It's living the great life. And that's what he's talking about. Not just extending your life so you can live a longer life, but remembering your creator in the days of your youth so you can live a great life. That's what God wants us to live. He wants us to live a great life where we're not allowing all the events of this world around us, things that we can't control. We're not going to allow these events of life to bring us down and to, and to depress us and to cause us to have a bad outlook on life and bad responses to people, but to, but to go beyond that and to see that God has a plan for us and a purpose for us in this life and to have that outlook in life that's not just, okay, I've got to make it from day to day, but to recognize that I can follow God every single day of my life. And as the Bible says, I can live a life of purpose where I love God every day and I love people every day and I serve God as I serve others. That's the type of life that the Bible tells us that's a great life. It's a life that we wake up looking forward to as we live this life for God. That is a life of purpose. But it starts up here or in here, however you want to look at it. It begins with a decision, with a choice to say, I am going to live this life for God and I'm not going to let the events of this world around me pull me down, but I'm going to stand above them in joy in my relationship with God and show, and show others what it means to remember my creator in the days of my youth. Let me give you another example I recently heard about a race car driver named Alex Zanardi. And um, he was very famous, very successful as a race car driver. In just four years, in open wheel um, race car competition, he won 15 out of 66 races that he entered. He reached the podium 28 times in those 66 races. And in 1997 and 1998, he won the CART, C-A-R-T, he won the CART championship. But a few days after our 9-11 events, he was in a terrible car crash. As he left the pits in, um, in a, during a race in Germany on September 15, 2001, Zanardi's car lost traction, spun up the racetrack right in the path of another car. The impact of that other car hitting him as he was sideways um, tore the nose completely off of Alex Zanardi's car. In his interview, he said, a little bit of Alex went one direction and a lot of Alex went the other direction. His legs were severed at the knees. He lost so much blood at the scene that he nearly died. He was in a coma for several days and at one point, at least, his heart stopped beating. We look at that as a very tragic event. But I didn't know about Alex Zanardi because he was a race car driver or because he, he was in that terrible crash. I know about him because he competed in the Ironman last year. He swam the 2.4 miles. He rode the 112 miles on a special hand cycle propelled by, like with the pedals pushed by your, by your arms. And then he completed the marathon in one of those racing wheelchairs. He didn't let life's events crush him. He continued to set new goals in his life. And he was interviewed for that Iron Man, and he said, the circumstances of my life aren't a tragedy. They're a gift. And then he spoke of how lucky he was. Your life is a gift. God has blessed us so much in our lives, and we know better than thinking about being lucky. We know it's a blessing. God has given us blessings in our life. And we can get past tragedies. We can get past difficult times. We can get past the circumstances in life that seem to want to bring us down. We can get past all that if we choose to see this life as a blessing from God and remember our Creator every single day living that great life that God has given, given us to live. But I think along, time, along our life, because sometimes things get a little diff difficult, because at times we aren't, you know, life isn't exactly what we want it to be at that particular moment, we start wishing our life away. And instead of living this great life, this life of purpose, this life that, that where we're loving God and, and, and doing what God wants us to do and living this, this purpose full of life, 
enjoying the life. Remember, enjoying means joy, having that joy of our life every day, no matter what's going on around us. We start saying, well, maybe, maybe later on I can enjoy this life or some other event will cause me to enjoy this life. And we start wishing our life away. One writer wrote it this way. When we're young, we want to be older so that we can drive, date, and set our own rules. When we're a little older, we want to be older still so that we can be more established in our career and earn more money and have more things. So in those years that we're finally at that point of our productive years of our life, we find ourselves dreading the work week, looking forward to the weekend so that we can finally have enjoy life again. And suddenly we find ourselves saying, where did time go as our kids move away? We're experiencing that this week. Parker, our youngest, is going to move away. And um, after Caitlin moved away and Ashley moved away, and now Parker is going to move away. Changes in our lives. We then, in that part of our life, we start wishing for retirement so that we can engage in the activities that we enjoy. And then we retire and we wish we had the energy of our youth. Don't wish your life away. We need to live that life, remember our creator in the days of our youth, every day of our life. Live that life of purpose. Live that with that correct outlook on life. Live that great life, that life of following God and doing what God wants us to do in our lives. It's a choice of how we, how we handle the situation in life, how we handle um, events of life. So that's one lesson in... Um, Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Another lesson is reach the right conclusion. As we come to the end of our lives and we think about things and as we're going through life, we need to make sure we reach the right conclusion. You know, it's interesting as we've been going through um, the book of Ecclesiastes, where it's kind of like, come on, Solomon, tell us what, tell us straight, tell us what we're supposed to do here. You're given all this kind of strange language and, and these pictures of life and again, birth and death and, and all of these things. Kind of, you know, wrap it up for us. Help us out here. Well, he does. He gives us pictures of it along the way, glimpses of it along the way, and then he wraps it up in Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person for God will bring every act to judgment everything which is hidden whether it is good or evil if you mark your Bible this would be a good passage to mark because this is what Solomon tells us is true and right and this is the this is the conclusion we need to have about life. This is all of Ecclesiastes has been leading up to this point. This is the conclusion. And he says a few things in here. First of all, first part of that conclusion, fear God. Now we've talked about that. It's kind of a it's a this phrase fear God is a is a is a, a phrase that we're just not used to. We we have a hard time defining that in our lives. We've, I've tried to define that as we have gone through the book of Ecclesiastes. But to fear God is that having that, that reverence and that awe as we think of who God is. Think of it this way. When you go somewhere and you see a majestic sight, maybe you've gone to Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon or Yosemite or, you know, someplace, and you go and you look out there and you say, my that is majestic. And it just kind of takes your breath away. Maybe it's the birth of a child. I mean, there's so many things in life that we can just, as we're involved in, and we just say, that just takes my breath away. I mean, that is just so overwhelming. When you think about that, remember this. This will help you have understanding of God. God is the majestic creator of that majestic sight. He's that creator. And so when we think about God, it should take our breath away. One thing I really appreciate about our worship time together is that the songs that we sing focus on the majesty of God, how great God is and, and, what he's, and who he is and, and, and help us get that big picture of God. But that thought is not just for one hour a week. 
That thought is for every day of your life. Remember that about God every day. That's what it means to fear God, to have that majestic understanding, that awe-inspired sense of who God is. When we do that, it's going to humble us, right? We'll recognize a little more of what God is like, and then we'll see who we are, his creation, um, and that should humble us before him. So to fear God properly, we have the right, we must have the right view of God. A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. Now think about that. What you think about God is the most important thing about you because that's the most important relationship. He is the most important one in our life and we should, we should learn to have that proper understanding of who he is. Don't bring God down to your level. Don't try to think of God as like you. We need to understand how awesome he is. We should be awestruck when we think about God in our lives. We don't have to walk to fear. God doesn't mean we go around in terror and when we think about God and running from God or things like that. It's to have that proper perspective of who he is. And then that gives us the proper perspective of who we are. You know, you'll hear sometimes people outside of the church, sometimes famous people talk about how they're going to talk to God someday and how they're going to tell God, you know, what things are all about. Now, uh -huh. Better to get that view of God now because you will eventually get it as we stand before God someday. So that's that special view of reverence and that to be awestruck by God. The problem is in life we don't fear God, but we fear everything else. I've talked about this. We get all we get fearful about things in this world. And you know, Ryan talked about Facebook. When I read Facebook and I read what some Christians post, um, it's like what are we so afraid of in our lives that we keep posting all these things, all these fears of our life? If we will fear God, we don't have to fear anything else because God, then we recognize that God is truly above and more powerful than anything else. He can defeat any army of fear that comes into our lives. So think about it. What are we afraid of? Are you afraid of death? I mentioned that earlier. I know that there are people that are afraid of death. Um, there, you know, there's just maybe their maybe their faith is a little bit weak when it comes to that to that part of their lives. Or for someone who has no faith in God, they would be afraid of death or trying to talk themselves out of what happens after death. Solomon has spent this whole book telling us that we live this life now because death is coming. Not to fear death, but be prepared for death because we're following God in our lives and then we don't have to fear it. Are you afraid of evil people who can do evil things and hurt others? Are you afraid of the unknown? We need to be careful, obviously. We need to be watchful in life, but we don't need to be fearful in this life. God is, God is more powerful than that. Jesus says, don't fear what people can do. And they can do terrible things. He even said it. They can kill you. But don't fear that. Fear the one who can do more than just what happens to your body. So that's the first part of his conclusion, fear God. The second part of his conclusion is keep God's commandments. Keep his commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Keeping the commandments of God is to keep his rules and fulfill his expectations of our lives. And that's what we need to do. And, and Jesus sums it up. And we've talked about this. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love people. That's when we will fulfill what God has told us to do by following that conclusion that God has given us of keeping his commandments. And the third part of his conclusion, remember he is the judge. We need to remember that. He's the judge. You know, I thought about this. I can judge you. You know, I can do that. I can judge you. And you can judge me. We can judge each other. But really, what does that do? It, it has no effect. It doesn't do anything to us. Because we have no power behind that judgment. We need to think of the one who is the real judge, the ultimate judge. And that's what, that's what Solomon tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes. God is the ultimate judge. And he will, just, he will judge justly. 
fairly. And with mercy, thank the Lord for that. But it will be complete. And so as we think about, as we think about the ultimate judge, judge, his judgment does make a difference to us. And so that's why Solomon reminds us to make sure that we remember he is the judge. Read in the scriptures, plenty, of, plenty to read about God as judge. We maybe don't want to talk about that at times. We, we don't want to think about it, but he is that ultimate judge. Now, we have a promise in scripture that in Christ we do not stand in a condemning judgment with God because we've been forgiven. Our sins have been forgiven. And so, so we don't have to fear that judgment as well. So, what's your outlook on life? Do you live with a purpose? Do you live that great life that God wants us to live? Do you remember God every day of your life? Do you fear God? Do you live for God? Do you, have you come up with the conclusion, not just your idea, but the conclusion that Scripture shows us about life and about God? That's what Solomon's been teaching us here in Ecclesiastes chapter 12. How to live from this birth to this death in a way that pleases and honors God. And that's what we can do. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for um, your word. And, and even in this book of Ecclesiastes, that's hard to understand at times uh, because we're just not used to it. Thank you for um, the message that comes in at the very end, this message that's very clear of what you want from us. I pray, Father, that we would be a people that, um, that honor you and live for you. Help us to be, have that attitude of living that life and recognizing the blessings that come free, from you so we can live in the joy that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen.